I want to uh, welcome everyone uh, to this evening's uh, panel discussion entitled Vaccination Gap, the Causes and Consequences of Under-Vaccination in California. I'm Michael Eichberg, I'm the Executive Director of the Wheeler Center uh, for Emerging and Neglected Diseases here at UC Berkeley. That's a center dedicated to promoting scientific research and education in fields relating to infectious diseases. And the center organized this event today in collaboration with the Division of Epidemiology at Berkeley School of Public Health. So, vaccines are among the most effective public health measures that have ever been introduced. They are responsible for eliminating the scourge of smallpox, putting us within striking distance of doing the same with polio, and since Edward Jenner's discovery of immunization more than 200 years ago, saving countless lives. However, vaccines are of course not without limitations. There is no proven vaccine available for Ebola, which has been painfully clear to us during uh, the West African outbreak, almost spiraled out of control as a result. Nor are there any vaccines available today for AIDS, malaria, pulmonary tuberculosis, or dozens and dozens of other diseases that sicken and kill millions every year. They're also not free, they can be difficult to store, they can be difficult to transport to where they're needed. Nor are they completely without any side effects. In addition, some people all over the world resist vaccines. Certain Hindu and Muslim groups in India have long held a belief that vaccination is a covert method of family planning. In parts of Nigeria, uh, polio vaccines are resisted by those claiming that it uh, could cause sterility or, or AIDS. And in Pakistan, polio vaccinators have been murdered, we understand, in part because uh, alleged fears that they might be Western spies. But tonight, we're going to look here in California at under-vaccination, a topic that's been highlighted recently by an outbreak of measles uh, that started at Disneyland and has caused 131 cases of measles in our state thus far, including six in Alameda County. We have a panel of experts in infectious disease and public health, as well as law and anthropology, and a panel that will engage in the discussion moderated by uh, Berkeley's own uh, Art Reingold, Chair of the Department of Epidemiology. After the moderated discussion, we will have time for questions and comments from the audience. I must ask that all of our visitors here hold their comments until this time. I ask not only that you be respectful of our speakers tonight, but also of the many students in the audience who we at Berkeley are trying to educate not only about infectious disease, but also proper decorum and mutual respect. Please be an example for them. Before we start our panel discussion tonight, we have invited a special speaker to help set the stage. Personal stories and, and interactions amongst people, doctors and their patients are a very important part of the topic of vaccinations in this country, and one that all too easily can but should not get lost uh, in the science. Carl uh, Quawit is a resident of Puerto Madera in Marin County. He and his wife Jody are the parents of two children, one of whom, seven-year-old Rhett, was diagnosed with leukemia. He has not yet been vaccinated for the measles or several other diseases because of the damage chemotherapy has done to his immune system. Rhett's situation has driven Carl to become a, and his family to become an activist, advocate for increasing vaccination rates in our state uh, and our nation, and we welcome him here tonight to share some of his family's perspective for you. Hello, can you hear me? Great. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and I will um, correct you on one thing, thankfully, and that is that on February 14th, our son, Rhett, marked one year from the end of chemotherapy, which gave him the go-ahead to get vaccinated. And uh, two weeks ago, he had his first uh, round of vaccinations. He got the MMR. Um, and I can't remember one other one also. And next month, he's going to get a whole bunch more. So within the next few months, he's going to be totally vaccinated. So I tell you this because now the risk to our child is not that great. He's protected. But more than four years ago, on October 28th, Giants I'm playing St. Louis to win the pennant. It's raining, something we haven't seen in a while. Um, 
And my son's screaming in his bed saying, my foot hurts. He had an infection. An infection and he didn't have any white blood cells. Why? Because he had leukemia. A blood cancer. We went to the hospital in Marin, or in general. They said, well, your son is very sick. They backed up an ambulance and took us to UCSF in San Francisco over the Golden Gate Bridge. And every time I cross that bridge, I think about that ride in the ambulance. And we get there, and my son has cancer. 87 days we were in the hospital for the first round of treatment. 156 nights sleeping on that uncomfortable vinyl couch. Total in three and a half years. Thousands of doses of chemotherapy. My daughter said to me one day, well, it's kind of like my parents are divorced because one night I see my dad and the next night I see my mom because one of them's in the hospital with my brother. While we're in the hospital, babies came in with pertussis. Lots and lots of sick people there. There was a time when we had to go to the intensive care unit because our son had to have a series of tests every hour. They had to take blood and test his blood sugars and everything else. And they needed to do it where the nurses could check on him every hour and every half hour. I was stressed. I thought my back hurt. Turned out I had shingles. Why did I have shingles? Because I had chicken pox when I was a kid. There was no vaccine. And when I found out I had shingles, the first thing the doctor said, well, it's okay, we can take care of it. You just don't want to be around anybody that's on chemo. I became acutely aware, aware of the importance of vaccinations. A son comes home from the hospital. He's grown up. Now he's ready to go to kindergarten. He's still got a... Oops, he's still got a probiac, this tube coming out of his chest because he has to have an infusion every night that takes about two and a half hours. And every time his counts were low, he wouldn't be able to go to school. But when he could, he was strong enough, he was still at risk of getting sick. And there were a few times that when he got sick, they had to stop chemo. Stop chemo can't cure the cancer. That's a problem. So, keeping illness out of our community is what saves lives. Lives like my son's and many, many other people who are immune suppressed. I asked our school to make sure that everybody in Red's class was vaccinated. I said, sure, no problem, we can do that. It was a step. When we uh, heard about a um, chickenpox outbreak, outbreak, a few cases in the middle school, the school notified us. And they said, oh, there's some chickenpox in the middle school. We need to make you aware of it because your son is doing chemotherapy. And the answer was, or our response was, are the, were the children immunized? And can you please make sure that nobody comes to school who is not immunized? The answer was not, we don't want to do it. The answer was, we can't, because the law prohibits us from doing it. The school worked very hard um, since December to call every single parent at the uh, Union School District. Those that didn't have their records up to date, those that were opting out for reasons of personal choice or medical exemptions like ours. And they worked very hard to figure out what is it about these people that are not vaccinating their children. But there was nothing they could do because the law protects the people with the personal belief exemption. 
Then comes the measles outbreak, and I am a person that, I like to talk. I do it at work all the time. But I rarely comment on the blogs or on the Facebook or the Twitter sphere and all that kind of stuff. But when the measles thing happened, I got afraid. I really got afraid because I live in Marin. And I was convinced because I understand the science. Herd immunity was not high. Enough. So this time I went to the media, responded on a blog, and I said, if we could do something to raise immunization rates, if we could do something to raise the vaccination rate, could we pass a law? Would people be liable if their child gets measles and gives my kid the measles and my kid dies? Those were some of the questions I was asking. The media picked up on our story. And then the story came to us. This was not our story. We've worked very hard with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to advocate for affordable access to Tier 4 medications for cancer patients, for cancer research, for diseases that still have not, that we still don't have a cure for. Measles? Done. Polio? Done. Smallpox? Done. And yet they're coming back. Why? Because in our culture, through news stories and other kinds of storytelling, individualism is taken to such a degree that it's hard for people to see how these choices impact the health of others. It's been easy for people to emphasize personal choice over protecting our community. And that, for us, is a moral and an ethical <clears throat> obligation. So that's why we're still here advocating. That's why we've changed our message. That we're, that's why we're standing up in front of groups like you. That's why we went to Sacramento. That's why we're pleased that 29 states in the last month have introduced legislation to tighten up vaccination laws. Um, our story is what I like to say is, no news is the news. Our kid's fine. Why? Because my wife Jody and I had the courage to stand up and do something about it. Um, and so we're pleased with that. So thanks for coming tonight, and I look forward to hearing the questions from the panelists. Thanks very much, Carl. I'm going to ask our panelists to uh, please take their seats. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our panel tonight. Uh, starting from stage right, we have uh, for uh, Dory Rubenson Rice, who's a professor of law at the University of California's Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. Uh, she has written extensively on the legal issues related to vaccines and vaccination, including uh, exemption laws, uh, which Carl just mentioned, and uh, tort liability. Uh, next we have uh, John Schwartzberg. He's an infectious disease physician who spent uh, 25 years in clinical practice before joining UC Berkeley's uh, faculty at the School of Public Health, uh, where he teaches and directs a joint medical program at UCSF. He continues to practice, uh, including with all debates. Uh, next is uh, Sharon Kaufman. She's a professor of medical anthropology at the University of California, San Francisco, where she chairs the Department of Anthropology, History, and Social Medicine. Uh, she has a long-standing interest in many aspects of the culture of U.S. medical uh, sciences practitioners and participants, including uh, parents who have concerns about vaccinating their children. Uh, next is uh, Janet Behrman. She is the public health officer for our dear city of Berkeley. Uh, as such, uh, she has the primary responsibility for ensuring the collective health and safety of the city's more than 110,000 residents, uh, an effort requiring negotiation of remarkable diversity and substantial inequities in economic and social conditions here. Thank you, uh, Janet. And finally, uh, we have Art Reingold, a professor uh, and head of epidemiology here at UC Berkeley, uh, as well as an associate dean, uh, the associate dean for research uh, at the school. 
Uh, in addition to an impressive and extensive record of research and teaching in infectious disease around the world, he serves as one of our nation's foremost experts on vaccine and vaccination policy. He's our moderator for this evening, and so I'll now turn the proceedings over to you, Art. Uh, so, Mark, put up the slide for me. I thought before we get to my asking our panelists some questions, I would start with a quote from Benjamin Franklin. You can't go wrong with a quote of Benjamin Franklin. Um, and I think um, we all understand that because of the use of the vaccine, we don't confront a problem with smallpox anymore. But this is what one of our, leading, our, our, our nation's leaders 200 years ago uh, had to say uh, about the fact that one of his children died of a vaccine-preventable disease. Um, and that in retrospect, uh, he would have preferred uh, to have had his child vaccinated. We had smallpox vaccine available at the time of the Revolutionary War, and he had opted not to vaccinate his child. So um, I think that this is meant to at least frame the discussion about why people might choose not to immunize their child. I think we'll start out with the assumption that everyone loves his or her children, and everyone wants to do what's best for his or her children. Um, and so why is it that people might choose uh, to leave their child unprotected against a variety of infectious diseases for which we now have what at least many of us believe to be highly effective and very safe vaccines. So that's a topic that we obviously want to talk about. I'm sure people in the audience will have points of view that they will also hear about. But we want to start with the panel. And so I was going to ask John if you could just say a little bit about in the panoply of the different diseases we do have vaccines against, um, which ones um, have we had the most success with in terms of um, reducing or eliminating them through vaccination? And, and which ones do we potentially have a lingering problem with, at least perhaps in part, uh, because of an underutilization of existing vaccines? Thanks, Mark. Well, I practiced infectious diseases in, in Berkeley for almost 30 years, and I saw one case of tetanus. Lady in her early 80s who had sliced her hand on a plate glass. Um, and a surgeon did a beautiful job sewing it up, but never bothered to ask her if she had had a tetanus shot. And she was the wife of a physician, and she had never had a tetanus shot. That's the only case of tetanus I had seen clinically in 30 years of infectious disease practice. Um, a testimony to the fact that our vaccine that's been around for nearly a century now is so efficacious. I've never seen a case of diphtheria. The vaccines work wonderfully well. Um, I have seen measles. Um, I caught measles from a patient of mine in 1977, and I've never been as sick um, as I was with measles. Missed uh, almost two weeks of work and thought I was going to die. Um, but that was because I assumed I caught measles because I was born well before 1957 when the CDC cutoff has occurred. My children have never had measles and my grandchildren have never had measles. And I had chicken pox and my children have never had chicken pox and my grandchildren have not had chicken pox. So to answer your question in a more specific way, I think we've had tremendous success with diphtheria and tetanus, with mumps, measles, rubella, with chicken pox, and of course with polio, I still remember, as I'm sure many of you do, uh, were more in my generation, of standing in line, so excited to get the uh, salt vaccine, excuse me, the saving vaccine, the sugar cubes. Um, it, was, it was just a miracle, uh, especially for our family, because my first cousin, who I just adore, at age six developed polio, and has never moved his arms after that. Um, so, those are just a few, a potpourri of a few of the incredibly valuable vaccines. I think some of the challenges we have in terms of vaccines um, remain with pertussis, uh, whooping cough. It's a good vaccine, but it's not as good as we would like, and we still see some breakthrough cases, and it perhaps doesn't give us as good an immunization as we would like. I really neglected to mention in the list of really great vaccines would be, of course, the hepatitis vaccines. Um, a year before I started, in 1975, seeing patients at Alpha Base Hospital here in Berkeley, a laboratory technologist had uh, cleaned up some blood from um, an unknown patient's um, blood sample. 
and contracted hepatitis B, developed unusually for that disease, what's called fulminant hepatitis, his liver just was destroyed, and as a young man he died. Um, we just don't see hepatitis B anymore. And in China, of course, um, the most common malignancy that kill people, uh, liver cancer, is now uh, on its decline because of the hepatitis B vaccine. And I still remember the um, gamma globulin shots that we had to get if we wanted to travel outside of the United States to prevent hepatitis A. It was a really thick serum that really hurt when they injected it in. And of course now we have a vaccine to prevent that that works incredibly well. I probably missed a few on the list, but the bottom line is that um, we need a little more work with the pertussis, although still a good vaccine. But frankly, the other ones we have in our panoply of uh, our, in our armamentarium are just superb. Okay, and I think it is worth pointing out for people who don't know that pertussis whooping cough is a somewhat different situation because in an effort to make a safer whooping cough vaccine, one that has fewer side effects, we switched to something called the acellular pertussis vaccine a number of years ago. We now know that that vaccine-induced immunity does wane over time. So that in an effort to make, in fact, as safe a vaccine as possible, we may have given up something in the nature of long-term durable protection, and that's contributing to the problem of whooping cough. So, so, John, one other question for you before we move on to others. So, I think, obviously, a major concern to people is the safety of vaccines. Um, and what we know about their side effects, what we know about their long-term effects, what we know about the relationship of vaccination to conditions such as autism, and other conditions. Could you just say a little bit about it? Obviously, it's a very complex topic. Thanks. I'll say a little bit about it. I will say that um, I wish we had as much data about the drugs that you can go into the pharmacy and buy over the counter in terms of safety as we have about the safety profile of vaccines. Uh, as was said in the introduction, of course, anything, any medication or any vaccine we have, of course, will have side effects. Um, but we know more about the consequences of vaccine in terms of side effects uh, and risks than we know about the vast majority of drugs that your physician may prescribe or that you may just go buy over the counter. The, more specifically, um, the issue about autism, I think this is almost beating a dead horse now, but the, there have been so many studies and so many hundreds of thousands of people looking at the risks of autism associated with vaccines, and it just is not there. I, th I find perhaps the most interesting study uh, being the one that was done not quite a decade ago uh, in one of the Scandinavian countries that looked at several hundred thousand people uh, that received vaccines, um, versus uh, MMNR vaccine versus a group that did not. And the autism rate happened to be a little bit higher than the group that did not receive the vaccines. And this is talking about hundreds of thousands of people when you compile all these studies. So I think that, um, generally speaking, there are risks. They are very, very small, and we know about them. It's not that they're a great unknown. Uh, and that there's no association with autism. Thank you. So I want to move on and ask Janet. I think the people in the audience know, based on her uh, introduction to Janet, is the health officer for the city of Berkeley. Berkeley is, uh, is the only city in California. There, there are three cities in California that have their own health offices, in addition to the county, which have health offices. And Berkeley is very privileged to have a wonderful health officer in the form of Janet. But Janet, I was wondering um, if you could say a little bit about what we know about under immunization here in California. What are some of the reasons why children might not be fully immunized? I'd be happy to. Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, before I do, I think that, that our stories as physicians and public health professionals are, are an important part of the narrative here, and I just want to share with you that I'm a pediatrician, and like John, have had lots of personal experience with vaccine preventable diseases, starting with receiving the smallpox vaccine myself as a very young child when I traveled to India with my family. There's no need for my children or your children to get that anymore because we've eliminated smallpox. Um, during my training as a resident, two of the most feared infections in sick infants coming into the hospital were pneumococcal disease and Haemophilus influenza type B. And pediatricians training and in practice now see those diseases rarely, whereas we saw them absolutely regularly, and those are additional successes of, of, that, of uh, childhood vaccination. As a pediatrician in training, I never saw a case of measles. But the first place that I went to practice was Amer American Samoa. 
and I practiced there for four years in the late 80s and early 90s and was there during the last large measles outbreak in this country, which spread to that country and saw a lifetime supply of measles. I don't need to see any more, thank you very much, but I can recognize it across the room. And I was very sobered by taking care of more than a dozen children who died from measles in a population of 50,000 people. So those personal experiences that we as physicians and public health officials bring to this work, I think are important context for people who are making these decisions. And some of that is related to the gray hair and the history that sits up here, uh, because younger folks haven't had the opportunity to see as much of that firsthand. So that said, in the public health sphere where I now practice, we collect a lot of data. Uh, the California Department of Health collects every year from every school and every licensed child care facility in the state information about the rates of completeness of vaccination and the rates of personal belief exemptions and medical exemptions for students and children in those facilities. And what we know from that is that statewide about 92% of children in licensed child care and children entering kindergarten are fully immunized. Now, the definition of fully immunized is different for child care than it is for kindergarten, particularly around the MMR vaccine as well as others with child care completion is considered one dose and for kindergarten it's two doses. Um, for this current year, the under and for other years, but the pattern of that under immunization is that it's higher in private schools than it is in public schools. So private schools have higher rates of under vaccination or non vaccination than do public schools. And in child care, Head Starts actually do the best in terms of vaccination. Children in, in Head Starts are the most likely to be vaccinated and the least likely to have exemptions. We see those same patterns in kindergarten and again in seventh grade, although there isn't a Head Start at those levels. Um, the personal belief exemption rate also is significantly higher at private schools and child care than it is in public ones, with about a two-fold difference. So in California this year, the rate of personal belief exemptions in child care and kindergarten is over 5%, and the rate in, sorry, in private schools and in public schools, it's just over 2%, and statewide it's about 2.5%. Starting this year, there was a new requirement about personal belief exemptions, which you may be aware of, that required that parents who wanted to be exempt from immunizing their children to enter child care or school, in addition to just having to sign themselves and say that they didn't want to be vaccinated, they had to also have a health care professional sign and say that they had provided them with information about that choice. And that has resulted in a decrease, or is correlated with, it's not necessarily causation, a decrease in the rate of personal belief exemptions at all levels in schools in California this year. Um, I think I'll stop there. So, what proportion of unimmunized children are unimmunized because parents have made that choice as opposed to a failure in the program to reach children? So, we don't have great information about the reasons because it's not something that's asked, but I can tell you something about the demographics of the under, of the under immunized. So as I said, it's, it's much more common in the private school population than in the public school population. The highest rates of being unvaccinated or under vaccinated are among white students and children in childcare, and the lowest rates are among Asian students in childcare and school, with African American and Hispanic populations being intermediate in the rates. The geography of under vaccination looks different depending on what level you look at. So if you look at the whole state, we're doing pretty well. We have a 92% completion rate. If you look at the county level, the counties that have low levels of completion or high levels of under immunization tend to be smaller and more rural counties like Nevada County, Mono, Mariposa, Lassen, Humboldt. But then when you look within counties at individual schools in them. I'm seeing the health officer from Marin County sitting incognito in the audience here. He can tell you that there are certain schools and area and school districts within his jurisdiction that have very high rates of under vaccination that, that rival or exceed those of the county levels of some of those other counties. So there's, there's a great deal of geographic variation and we know that there's clustering not only geographically but by what kind of school one attends by faith-based organizations that one has a, an association with and others. And we don't have as complete or clear information about that statewide as we would like. But certainly those identified pockets of under and, of un and under immunization 
present both opportunities for us in public health and challenges. There are opportunities in terms of targeted outreach and education and information, as well as engaging in constructive conversation and understanding that phenomenon. There are also challenges in the setting that we're, like we're currently in of the measles outbreak. So before I move on to Sharon and Dorit, I wanted to put you on the spot in one other way. So um, I don't know about the extent. I, when I was, a, when I, my three children were growing up, we wanted to minimize visits to the pediatrician. We would say, what do you mean you can only give him five shots today? Can't you give him all of them? I can't come back next week. I really would kill him up regularly. And minimize my visits to the doctor. And so my pediatrician didn't have to waste much time convincing me uh, to get vaccination. But obviously, if parents are concerned or hesitant about vaccination, then it may take a substantially greater time and interaction to explain and potentially convince a, a, a concerned parent. So what's, what's that interaction like when you confront a, a parent who's hesitant or concerned about immunization? So I actually think it's very much like every conversation that a pediatrician has with the, the parents and the children in his or her practice, in that that conversation is based on what relationship you've established with the family, <coughs> their level of trust, trust and your level of credibility with them and your ability as a practitioner to understand where they're coming from, to address their concerns, and to support them in making the best decisions that they can make for their children. And I want to harken back to what you said at the beginning, Art, about we assume, and I assume, both in my public health role and in my pediatrician role, that parents are making decisions in the best interests of their children and that sometimes our role is to help, um, help them navigate a, an increasingly uh, vast amount of information that one can consult in those decisions. Okay, well maybe we'll come back to the question. I think some people know that some pediatricians uh, have even fired patients that have decided they're not, they, won't, they, they can't in good conscience take care of a patient who, whose parents refuse immunization. Other pediatricians are willing to work with parents to try and craft individual schedules, but obviously there's a range of practice on the part of healthcare providers. John, I, I don't know if you have anything else to say, but otherwise we'll move on to Sharon and Dorit. So I have a lot to say about it, but let's move on to Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> so Sharon, maybe we could uh, ask you to say a little bit about something about what we know about the history of, of either vaccine hesitation or rejection of vaccination here in the United States? Sure. Well, I'm happy to talk about uh, recent developments. Um, but first, I just want to uh, join the others. You see we're all of us the same generation, and I want to let you know how I, as a medical anthropologist who mainly studied geriatrics, end-of-life care, medical technologies, and hospitals around death and dying, got uh, involved in this topic at all, I was um, very aware at the turn of the millennium and, and then finally in 2006 that there was a huge cultural conversation going on about vaccine safety that was brand new. My children were born in 1978 and 81, so they were in their late 20s and early 30s. And I was very aware that when I was raising them and when they were vaccine age, there was no talk about vaccine safety. It wasn't part of the sensibility of being a parent, period. Absolutely not on anybody's radar. Something very deep and very profound had happened in the cultural landscape. And I was interested in exploring this as an anthropologist. And then in 2006, after the fourth or fifth study came out showing that the science showed that there was no causal relationship between anything in vaccines and autism, when the CDC spokesperson came out and made an announcement in public in Washington, D.C., he received death threats. And that was on the front page of the New York Times, and I noticed it and I thought, okay, what's going on in the cultural landscape is something that a medical anthropologist needs to look at. Because this was, um, this was serious. So I decided I needed to talk to parents of the next generation. And I learned a great deal from them. One of the things, so let me, so this is what I learned because this is, this actually answers your question. First of all, there's an incredible tension that emerged after the period that I raised my kids 
between the value of individualism and autonomous decision making and the value of social responsibility. And I think the measles outbreak, of course, shows that these two values are in great tension. They're in great tension in other areas of healthcare delivery and in other areas of life. It's part of the social fabric today. We have individual rights. The whole issue of rights has become very, very important. <coughs> We're going to talk about that. So we, there's also, who are we as citizens and what are the responsibilities of being citizens in a society? So these, these things are in play and intention. The other thing that's happened in 30, 35 years is that doubt about medical expertise, government authority, the authority of the pharmaceutical industry has become much larger than it ever used to be before. So when you put together the notion of uh, autonomous decision making and individual rights, the fact that we live in a, a neoliberal culture now where you have a moral responsibility to take responsibility for your own health, right? In other words, we have to be responsible for our own health and as parents for the responsibility of children. And you put that together with skepticism about authority and medical expertise and a generalized lack of trust, all of this becomes the background, the substrate, the air that has in which a conversation about the connections between vaccines and disease was able to foment and um, break through into a larger public. So the history is that there were a lot of things going on in the cultural landscape that enabled all of this doubt to arise. So I want to just uh, emphasize that the importance of individual responsibility in health is so with us, it's so part of the air that we breathe that nobody even notices it, okay? What do you have to do? You have to, as you age, you have to, you know, look at your cholesterol, the Fitbit, all of the devices today about individual monitoring of your own health. This is about how you take responsibility for your own health today. Now it's on an app. It used to be you went to the doctor for it. Um, but, you know, we all have to be responsible. Yet in this, we all know, and young parents today are very aware, that scientific truths don't settle. So for example, there's new dietary guidelines all the time. What, what have we just learned? You can now eat fats, right? I mean, it was for all those years you couldn't, you know, you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't eat fats. Now fats and eggs are okay. Um, there's huge debate about medical screening, okay? Mammograms, when should we have them? Should we have them at all? All of this. So, What's going on in the field of medicine is in huge upheaval around evidence, around what is the truth about something, and parents today are very aware that they're living in a moment when um, the scientific truths are up for grabs, they settle, they change, and in this, the whole topic of vaccine safety arose. So the two big events that really put this on the table were the, um, the uh, article in The Lancet in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield that was since retracted saying that he saw in a study of 12 children a connection between the MMR vaccine and neurodegenerative and um, uh, uh, abdominal gastric problems. His, uh, the Lancet retracted the article. He subsequently had his medical license withdrawn. The other thing, that was 1998, and then in 1999, the um, American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and the FDA determined, uh, looking at a study of um, mercury in all kinds of products, that the level of ethyl mercury, this is the element in thimerosal, may have exceeded certain guidelines for methyl mercury, the kind of mercury found in fish. So these two events happening a year apart, given the fact that they were that they happened in this landscape of a, of a of a growing mistrust of government and a growing sense of individual responsibility for making decisions about one's own health, made the whole thing really explode. The issue, what's happened, and I think the measles, the recent measles outbreak, is showing that doubt. Um, 
uh, continues to persist. It is very hard to get rid of doubt once there's a conversation about it. And the thing about being a parent today, as many of you in the room know, is you cannot look for information about vaccines without finding also information about autism. And you cannot look for information about autism without finding also information about vaccines. The information one finds may not be saying there's a cause and effect relationship, but the two pieces of information are put together on all kinds of websites and on all kinds of parents groups and everywhere. It's now a topic of conversation that has been joined. So it's very hard to dislodge it. And the fact that vaccines are something to talk about now is very deep in the culture of raising children. I think I'll stop there for a while. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure that the topic will come back to me. I wanted to move on to Dorit, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll actually end this part and move to questions and discussion a little bit later than perhaps my friends, because I suspect a lot of people would like to say something and uh, to interact with, with the panel. But, but Dorit, I'm, I'm delighted we have a lawyer in the room because I'm asked these questions all the time and I'm completely at sea. Um, but, but could you say something about the constitutional rights that people have in terms of uh, deciding not to have their children vaccinated and, and a little something about the variation from state to state, what the, what the Supreme Court has said. To such extent, we haven't had any new Supreme Court decisions. But every state or federal uh, court that ruled, and that's usually about school immunization requirement, and I'll say something about that in a moment, followed the same lead. Said it's fine to require vaccination, especially before going to school. What this means is that states have extensive leeway. And I want to add a caveat here. Jacobson was in 1905, and in 1905, we did not have the same emphasis on individual autonomy that we do now. Nonetheless, Many scholars believe that the main insights of Jacobson can apply now at least for children. Because when it comes to children, there is an intersection of two very powerful interests that contrast with individual rights. One is the interest in the public health. Remember, we're talking about public health, but the public is made of individuals. And the interest, the combined interest of those individuals to be free of this and have a safe environment is something to value. And in the tension between that public health and individual rights, courts give states, especially legislators, but also officials, a, a lot of leeway. But there's another interest here, which is the interest of the child. While vaccines have risk, as was mentioned here, the risk are much smaller than the risk of not vaccinating. And the state does have a role of protecting children, uh, and the combination of the child's interest and the public health interest Allow, give states dramatic leeway to require vaccination. How do states use it? Well, the most common uh, legal requirement related to vaccination <coughs> and now is our school immunization requirement. Every state has them, as does, uh, the, uh, as does our capital too. And every state has a, some differences in which immunizations are required before a child can attend school, and what are the um, uh, what's the schedule? They don't, I think none of them actually follow the exact CDC recommended schedule, although you can probably speak to that more than I can. Um, but they all have immunization requirements and they all have exemptions. <coughs> Most scholars believe that Jacobson's mean that a medical exemption is constitutionally required. Jacobson didn't directly address a medical exemption for children, but it's implied by the case that the medical exemption is required. If a child has a medical reason not to vaccinate, states have to give it, and all states have medical exemptions. 48 states also have non-medical exemptions, which include uh, philosophical, yes, which include as going reverse order, religious exemptions, personal belief exemptions, or both. California has, in a sense, a personal belief exemption, and I'll mention the religious exemption later, I think you'll We'll be talking about California law as well. How easy it is to get this exemption varies by state. The content of the specifics of the exemption can also vary by state. The one thing I want to highlight is that neither exemption is constitutionally required. It's 
from what I said earlier about the states having a tremendous leeway to require vaccination, you probably figured out that the personal belief exemption is not required. But even a religious exemption is not constitutionally required under federal law. And that's because courts have interpreted our constitution not to exempt people from general laws because they have religious beliefs. The most famous case is Employment Division versus Smith, in which the Supreme Court upheld enforcement of a, a law against using peyote on two Native Americans that everyone agreed with were using it for religious reasons. So you can apply a neutral general law to people who have religious objections to them. The, the la latest court, court to rule of this was Phillips was a, the Second Circuit in Phillips versus New York, which said you don't have to give a religious exemption at all. So the law really provides states extensively way to regulate the scenes pretty much any way the political, um, the political branches uh, decide. Let me ask one other question, and then we'll open it up for, for broader discussion. Um, <clears throat> By the way, I suspect if you read the New York Times, you'll notice that as of two days ago, Bangladesh has decided to arrest parents who don't allow their children to be vaccinated against polio. And according to the New York Times this morning, they actually started arresting large numbers of parents who failed to vaccinate their children. Presumably not a place we get, like to get to in the United States, uh, arresting parents who failure to vaccinate their children. But some people have raised the issue of if my child were, for example, damaged as a result of your child being unimmunized. Mm -hmm. So your child is unimmunized, develops measles, infects my child with uh, perhaps an immunosuppressive condition. Some people have raised the question, do I have the right to sue you, for example? Are there legal remedies for people who believe they've been injured by an unvaccinated child? Let's start from the point that anyone can sue for anything in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> there haven't been any cases on that point, but there have been other cases related to infectious disease and negligence behavior. A very old case from the 19th century uh, allowed someone to sue the owner of a boarding house who didn't tell a family that there was pertussis in the boarding house. Family went in, child got pertussis, and they sued, and this was allowed to go forward. So they have suits for infectious disease pretty much from the 19th century on. We haven't had a suit like this, and there's a couple of legal obstacles which I think are um, manageable, overcomable, but there are some legal obstacles. The most dramatic one is that normally we don't have a duty to act in the system. What do I mean? You're sitting, sipping a drink, and watching a baby crawl into a puddle and start to drown. You watch the baby drown, continue to sip your drink. I won't tell you what that tells about you, it says about you as a person, but legally you have no liability because you don't have a duty to help others out of your system. So the question becomes, is non vaccinating that kind of bystander action? There are two potential reasons that this probably won't protect families who don't vaccinate. The first is that the decision not to vaccinate is a lot more involved than the kind of bystander I described. You are the decision maker there. You are someone who has actively educated yourself, as we hear many of the people who choose not to vaccinate say, and you are someone who's actively making a decision. And second, we do have exceptions to the rule that there's no duty to act for policy reasons, and there's a good argument there's one here. So we haven't seen suits like that yet. I think it's partly because immunization rates have been very high until the last few decades. In you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's possible and, it's, and they think it's feasible and if things continue, we'll probably see. So let me see if any of the panelists have any other comments they'd like to make, but Mike, if it's okay with you, I think I'd like to open it up so we can have a broader discussion and reaction because people, I suspect many people would like to make comments. So, John? I want to comment on Benjamin Franklin. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the, he actively made the decision not to vaccinate his child. And one of um, our MPH students and I interviewed uh, Professor Lombroso. I don't know if she's here in the audience in the, in the Department of Psychology here for a year. But we interviewed her last week about this because she's done a lot of work on a, on a topic called admission bias, um, specifically addressing this issue of vaccination. And her research in this area of admission bias applies to what Benjamin Franklin did. It's a perfect example. And that's the idea that 
Um, when you have someone you really dearly care about and love like your child, it is often an unconscious process where you make the decision that it's easier to not do something and let nature take its course than to actively do something and God forbid what you did caused harm. And so we have an unconscious need to tilt towards omitting action. Which it just made me smile when you had that quote from Benjamin Franklin about that. So, so um, we have microphones right, for people who want to. So, if people would like to go to the microphone, would you be happy to entertain a broader discussion and questions and comments from, from you? Um, is this on? I guess it is. Hi. My name is Kathleen O'Donnell, and I am a registered pharmacist. I've been a pharmacist since 1979, so I imagine we sort of came up at the same time for our educational system. And I just wanted to um, ask you a question. The, um, so I've been a pharmacist. I also spent almost 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, with uh, close to $20 billion that the pharmaceutical industry has paid in civil and criminal penalties, in the last five years, is it really surprising that parents don't trust that you know what's happening? We've got the two whistleblower cases with Merck and the CDC coming up this year. Doesn't it seem rational that people would be distrustful of that kind of an organization? So maybe I'll take a crack at answering you at least a partial answer to that. Um, you know, I obviously am a pro-vaccination person. Uh, for those who don't know that, I actually currently sit on the, the ACIP, the Immunization Practices Advisory Committee of the, of the CDC. I'm clearly someone who favors vaccination. Uh, I want to make sure people understand the process that vaccines go through before they are licensed and, and, and understand that the FDA processes for licensure of vaccine in the United States are the most rigorous in the world and that all of us want to make sure that anything we're going to give to literally tens of millions of healthy individuals are absolutely as safe and effective as they can be. So while I can certainly understand your point that people might have reason to doubt industry, might have reason to be concerned about financial implications of what people are doing, um, personally, if I were having someone manufacture something to put into my children, I would rather entrust it to an organization that knows how to make a product day in and day out of high quality than to anyone else. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry knows how to do. Well, just one other comment about that. Um, we, you know, vaccines have been identified by the federal government. So if there is any harm or death that's caused to person who's been vaccinated, they aren't, aren't able to sue in court. They have to go through vaccine court. So how does it, how does it balance that if a, a product is indemnified, there is no real incentive to make a safer product? And I happen to know that I've been in meetings, sales meetings, where they are really happy to make vaccines because they don't have to worry about the, the liability. And they also don't pay as much to bring a vaccine to market as they do for a prescription drug. I'm going to let Dorit answer your question, but I at least can, have been told that if a child is injured by a vaccine, that yes, they, the, the, that's, the injury process is the first step they can take, but if they are not happy with the result of that, they still retain the legal right to file a suit. Anymore. So if, uh, it's true that we have a special scheme for compensating vaccine injuries. I want to highlight that this scheme is a no-fault scheme with a lower causation standard than what we have in the court. It's easier actually to show causation in the program than it would be in the court, and you don't have to show it a, a design defect as you would in the court. Uh, it used to be that you could if you were unhappy with the result, go to court. But in 2011, in Persevitz versus Wyatt, the Supreme Court limited that. Not completely. You can still see for some kind of uh, claims, but not for all. The Supreme, there's three types of product liability claims. 
One is design defects. That means you're saying the way the product was designed is unsafe. Under the Supreme Court decision, those can no longer be taken to state courts. The other two are manufacturing defects, which means the way the product was manufactured deviated from the standards. This is kind of the chair with three legs situation. Or warning defects. For those, you can still go to court if you're unhappy with the results. So there's limits on your ability to sue, but they still exist. Uh, my answer to you uh, in terms of the accountability would be to highlight two things. First, as a way to hold some people accountable, tort liability has very serious limits. It's uncertain, it's uh, inconsistent, it's not clear to me that it's a good accountability mechanism. And second, when we come to pharmaceutical company, I want to remind you that we have a lot of other accountability mechanisms in place, in the sense of the product is heavily regulated, the clinical trials are heavily regulated. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't actually had a clinical trial scandal, I think, in the US. We have, there's been some in third world countries, but not in the US in the last, what, 30, 40 years? Uh, and if a, a vaccine not only has to meet high safety standards, it can be pulled off the market if problems emerge after it arrives in the market, which has been done, for example, for the Rotashield vaccine in 19. If I, if I remember correctly. So we have a, a whole set of accountability mechanisms in place, and we have a no fault compensation system for vaccine injuries. It's hardly an unaccountable, unmonitored system. Thanks very much, uh, Jeff Owex, uh, <coughs> Minister for the School of Public Health. Thanks for a great event. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, I've really enjoyed your comments and it kind of got me thinking. You know, I, I think we have had an incredibly robust discussion recently about both social responsibility and scientific denialism. It's been particularly one reads some of the, the extensive comments and news pieces, and I, I think that's incredibly productive, I, I hope. I think so. I'm really deluding myself. In addition, in, in popular culture, I've been really struck by, we now have Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Fallon, I think, really kind of taking some of these themes and really kind of crystallizing them into incredibly sort of potent um, commentaries about vaccination and again in science and um, social responsibility. And it's certainly amusing. Um, but I guess the question I have, if you, if you then look to the population that um, has sort of the denialism, the mistrust, um, when you kind of get this sort of wave of sort of cultural movement, which I think is towards, you know, these themes of responsibility and, you know, we need to trust science. Yeah, I think that's there. What would you anticipate the response to be in the, you know, the population that we would say is anti-vax or denial? It seems like one downside would be that group would become more defensive and kind of sort of bunker down and form. I was wondering, sort of sociologically, what would you yeah. anticipate? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for you know, posing that uh, you know, in, a, in a nuanced way, because you know, the response is similar. I, I think one of the things that I discovered that I think is very important, and I want to get the point across, is that parents today who are living, who are dwelling in a world of risk and doubt and mistrust, and uh, your example of uh, of uh, the pharmaceutical, you know, distrust of pharmaceutical companies, that's, you know, one, a, a, something that feeds, feeds all that data and distrust. Parents of uh, vaccinated children today are not necessarily anti-vaccination. They aren't anti-vaccinationist. They aren't members of um, anti-vaccination um, support groups or websites or anything like that. What they are is trying to forge what I call a flexible ethics in this sea of connections being made and doubt, great doubt about, uh, about the fluctuations of science. So I, I think really the, most of the parents who are choosing not to vaccinate feel the sense, as everybody said, a huge sense of responsibility for protecting their own children and protecting their own health. They aren't necessarily anti-vaccinationists per se. When I interviewed uh, parents around the autism vaccine connection, they were all extremely uh, interested and aware of the science, very aware that autism has a large genetic component, 
aware also that there were very complex environmental factors that probably played into the cause uh, of autism. They did not, none of them who were choosing not to vaccinate actually believed that vaccines caused autism, but they were practicing an ethics of doubt and care. And I think that is what is persisting today. So people, I mean, there's, oh, there's been an anti-vaccinationist movement since Jenna, okay, since 1790 or 80. Um, but parents today mostly are not of that. They're careful, they're doubtful, and I think, uh, let me recommend uh, an incredible book that just came out by a young woman your age, Eula Biss's book on immunity. She's an English professor at Northwestern. And uh, in her book, I picked it up because the New York Times called it one of the best 10 books of 2014. And it's short. It's, a, it's an essay about her pers about the fact that she didn't know a thing about vaccines till she became, till she was pregnant, when all of a sudden the talk of parenthood, which is inescapable, is about vaccine safety doubt. And this is this new thing that I noticed. This did not exist 30 years ago. So she was very aware also that parents are not anti-vaccinationists in some global way. But they're try they have to become self-reliant because they can't trust expertise anymore. So that's really what's happening. And she put it beautifully. She had a sentence that said, it's a bad season for trust. And I think, you know, that's where we are in the United States today. Generally, having nothing to do with vaccines. It's a bad season for trust. I mean, you know, our, our economics, our banking system, our, you know, all of this stuff that's going on around us. So, again, it's, it's, part, of this, it's part of a larger story. Well, I also want to thank that it was a great group thought. And your earlier remarks, Dr. Coffin, were quite excellent about the fluctuations of science. Um, I'm a graduate of the School of Public Health and a parent, and uh, I think of myself as more pro-choice than anti-vaccination. There's certain vaccines that we got for our son, there's certain ones we didn't. And I didn't want my son to get the MMR at first uh, because I wanted him to get exposed to measles because there's evidence to show that people that get measles have reduced incidence of allergies. And because allergies tend to run on my wife's side, I thought this might help his immune system. And we have to realize that some childhood diseases are immunological challenges that are important. And the bottom line is the CDC and no drug companies even looked at these broader issues of, are our children healthier in general? Not just looking at, we don't deny that these vaccines are effective in reducing incidence of that particular disease, but are they healthier in general? We don't know. Uh, actually, when the former head of the CDC, Bernadette Keeley, was asked if, um, can it be said that vaccines don't cause autism, she says, no, you cannot say that they don't cause autism, because there is a chance they do. In fact, if, for those of us that respect the Cochrane Reports, which is, for people that aren't familiar, one of the most respected uh, uh, group of epidemiologists and, and researchers that look at research, in both their 2005 and their 2012 uh, meta-analysis of, of the MMR in children, they noted that it is unlikely to be associated with these different diseases, but they went on to conclude that the design and reporting of safety outcomes in MMR vaccine studies, both pre- and post-marketing, are largely inadequate. And as it turns out, right after the 2005 uh, meta-analysis in the Cochrane was reported, uh, reported, there was a press release issued at the AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science, that the headline was simply this. It said, Cochrane Library publishes the most thorough survey of MMR vaccination data. And the first sentence is, there was no credible evidence behind claims of harm from the MMR vaccine. So here that the Cochrane Report concludes that there's no adequate evidence, and at the same time there's, or, or no uh, quality evidence, and now all of a sudden that gets misreported of 
of they're safe and, and there's no problem. I, I think we do need to see the big elephant in the room. As a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Marsha Angel, who's now at Harvard, has emphasized is, is that we're now living in a, an economic climate where trust uh, from big pharma you know, is significant. And sadly, with this measles scare, coming right after the media began reporting about how this year's flu vaccine wasn't working, but we're not hearing about that. It, it, it got overtaken by this big measles scare. And, you know, to me, I'm a bit suspicious of that. I'll, I'll I'm not going to raise you on what the data are about the relationship between autism and MMR. I, I do disagree with you. A minor correction, Bern Beck Healy was the head of the National Institute of Health Office Center for the Disease Control and Prevention. But in any event, okay. I think you and I will have to agree to disagree about what the studies show about the relationship between NMR and autism. And I think it's somewhat ironic that you are concerned about the fact that our current influenza vaccine basically is not as efficacious as we would like. At the same time that you are raising doubts about one of the most effective vaccines ever created. So uh, you and I will obviously have to the 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 for people interested, there's a really good review of 86 studies that do link vaccines to autism. And no one says it causes, but like, you know, some people have said there's correlation too. And, you know, many of us know parents whose child seemed to develop their symptoms shortly after this vaccine. So I trust a lot of parents more than some studies. I think that um, a couple of, uh, of your points I'd like to address. One is um, about your statement about childhood diseases being health healthful. I know of no credible scientific evidence that suggests that any childhood disease is healthful to a child. I do know with absolute knowledge that many of these childhood diseases can be lethal. When you made the decision to allow your child to get measles, you made the decision that roughly about 0.2% of 1 in 500, you had a 1 in 500 chance that your child was going to die of measles. You and made that decision. That child is generally a very poor person that has no vegetables in their life. And no, that's, no that's absolutely, I'm sorry, that's not the case. That's, case, that's data from the United States in healthy people. That's the mortality rate. You know, before we had vaccines for measles, uh, roughly about 2.5 million children were dying every year on this planet from that disease. Today the number is a fraction of that. No one's saying that vaccines are 100% safe, but what we know is the morbidity and mortality from these diseases can be enormous. Measles has a very high mortality rate compared to when you look at undernourished people, you're absolutely right. But even when you look at healthy people, the number is about 0.2%, 1 out of 500. And that doesn't include the children that will be damaged permanently from measles, which is another number on top of that. So I would not expose my child to measles and take that kind of risk. Janet, did you want to? I just want to encourage you to look at the literature that does look at uh, atopic diseases and allergies and, and vaccines. I, I, That's worthy to, to look at. Yeah, well, I, I have looked at that literature, and I, you notice I answered the question specifically about childhood diseases. The literature is very interesting about helminthic disease and allergy, and I think that's a very interesting scientific area to pursue, but not about childhood diseases. Okay. Well, I some other I grew up in England. I had a total, I went back and checked my immunization records. I had a total of seven shots for three, um, three uh, different diseases. Um, that was the norm when I grew up. I'm only 40 years old. So I thought 
the measles, I got the mumps, I got scarlet fever, I got rubella, uh, I got whooping cough, and I'm here standing here in front of you while I. Um, I think, as I'm, I am now a mother, I think my, um, I want to talk to a few different things. Um, Sharon, to your point of distrust, I think my concern is we went from, in the last 20 years, we went from a handful of vaccines to now my children, up until age 18, today, get 69 shots. And it's increasing. There are 300 plus more vaccines in the pipeline. And that scares me, because I don't know of any research that's been done that looks at the combined effects of all of these. When a new vaccine comes out, it's not looked at. The vaccine itself is done, research is done on it. But it's not looked at in conjunction. There, are, there aren't tests that I know of, and if you know of them, please do tell me, because there aren't tests that I know of that look at each of those shots as taking them in conjunction. There are some, you know, what the kids get at three months old, those, because of the length of time that those, you know, those vaccines have been given together, there is some, you know, there's some, I don't even know if there's any scientific research, but I'm guessing that there is some, you know, causal research or correlation research done. But realistically, to me, it scares me the number of shots that our kids are getting and the number of, and the lack of research there is around the combinations of shots. Um, so I'm going to point that at you while I'm at it. Um, uh, Janet, I have my, point to you, my question for you, or my comment to you, you mentioned that um, the, the higher levels of non-immunization are in, public, in private schools versus, and not so much in public, um, in whiter ethnicities. To me, that says one thing. Those people are more educated. They're not as high in Head Start. The people are more educated, they're doing their research, and, and you can say that, oh, but they're doing the wrong research and the internet's opened up this whole thing, but they're doing their research, and so, to me, it, these people aren't stupid. They're not vaccinating for a reason. They want the choice to do what them and their pediatrician has best, has in the best interest of your, of your child, and you know, that's, you even said that. But it's working with your pediatrician to work out what is your family history? What is likely to happen? When baby's 12 hours old and gets the hep B shot, you have no idea what kind of immune system that baby has, what kind of allergies that baby has. And I think that's, I, mean, I think the people that are choosing not to vaccinate, choosing to vaccinate on a slow schedule, choosing the vaccine, some of them, yes, do I want my kid hep B? Sexually transmitted and, and, and transferred by needles. Those are the two main ways of getting happy. Does my 12, 12 hour old baby really need it at 12 hours old? Or can I wait till that baby is you know, a, a young adult and is getting sexually active? Those kind of things are, are, the, are the places where I feel that as parents, we need to be given the choice. I understand it's a public safety issue for many people, but as parents, we need to be allowed to have the choice and to make those decisions with our pediatrician. Um, I can, can comment back. I don't think there was really a question there. Um, one is that, um, to your latter point, I, you know, when in my point in sharing with you the demographics that under immunization is more common in private schools and more common among white, I would be exceptionally cautious about equating the smartness of that decision with anything about those demographics. My, I think the clearest information there is that this is most likely not an issue of access to vaccines and access to health care, which is one of the things that people sometimes think that is related to under or on immunization. And in the, in the past and in some settings has been. Um, and to your point about choice, you know, I, Art also said earlier that some pediatricians are quote unquote firing uh, patients from their practices. And a point that I haven't had an opportunity to make that I want to is that when I transitioned from being a pediatrician to being a public health official, I transitioned from having individual patients and individual families for whom I was responsible to being responsible for the health of an entire community. So in public health, we don't actually have the luxury of firing people. We can't make people go away from our practice. Our practice is everyone who lives here. And the value of this kind of dialogue and of your ability to express your 
you know, perspectives and our ability to, to share and, and express our perspectives is precisely what is needed, is this public discourse in the setting of lots of information, lots of mistrust, and lots of lack of clarity about where to place one's confidence in making those decisions. The first is that your point about the lack of uh, research about combined co uh, vaccine combination is simply incorrect. Before a vaccine is put on the market, manufacturers have to do concomitant studies. And if you go to PubMed and look for concomitant studies, you will find them. 69 shots. Again, they have to, for each vaccine that gets on the market, they have to look at that vaccine and how it, whether it's safe and effective with the rest of the schedule. And we have a lot of studies of vaccine combinations in different ways. It's just incorrect to say that the schedule hasn't been studied. The other point is about choice. And there, there are two different issues. One is the relationship between a brand and a pediatri pediatrician. Our system strongly protects parental choice uh, up to a point, which means that normally what the parents decide, you can't intervene with what the parent decides uh, with a pediatrician absent the direct risk to the child or other unusual circumstances. The other question is what are the consequences of the decision you make with the a pediatrician. And there, the very real question of whether you, the fact that you make a decision with your pediatrician to reject the science and leave your child with risk of disease is a good reason to allow you to decrease herd immunity in a school, to basically send your child with a high risk of disease to a place where they can infect others. And whether that decision, that private decision, is a good reason to exempt you from the consequences if, for example, your child infects another. These are two different issues. Um, there is no law on the table that I know that supports interfering with the first relationship, parent pediatrician child. It happens in some cir circumstances. For example, if a parent loses custody, there's a line of cases on whether the state can immunize over part of objection when the parent loses custody. But most of the time, that's untouched. What are the consequences when the parent's behavior touches others is a different question. So I'd like to try and give as many people as possible a chance to say something, so if you can try and keep them in the right so what, what, yes, I am Shrenika. Um, what is your advice to a parent who mistrusts medical research in light of the Merck lawsuit, as well as the CDC researcher who came out last year and said that the MMR vaccine they fudged some research there to show that there's no correlation with autism. What's your advice to a person, a parent, who mistrusts medical research because of that, as well as mistrust the mainstream media for not reporting on these issues? So for those who don't know, the first issue uh, lawsuit uh, mentioned here is a lawsuit by two former Merck employees who claim that Merck uh, falsifies data about the month's vaccine efficacy, effectiveness. And the lawsuit has not gone into fact-finding yet. There the, the are points either way. We don't know what will come out of it. Uh, but there is a lawsuit by two ex-employees claiming that there was a data fake in relation to a month's effectiveness. Um, so that's one lawsuit. Not safety, by the way. There's nothing in that loss of the defect safety, but it does affect the defect. The other claim is a more problematic one. And what appears to have happened is that a researcher in the CDC who was one of the researchers on a relatively small study looking at NMR and autism and age, decided about a year ago for some reason to unburden his concerns about one sub-result in that study to an anti-vaccine activist who recorded those talks without telling these people. And this year, uh, videos were made without telling this person, and this year, videos were made claiming that the CDC fake data. Uh, the only evidence that data was actually faked is a now retracted study by the anti activist, Dr. Brian Fruker, who isn't an epidemiologist, he isn't medically trained, and again, the paper was retracted partly because of non-disclosure of conflict of interest and partly because of fundamental flaws. There's no evidence of fraud, no real evidence of fraud. There's no evidence of a link between vaccines and autism. So the reason the media hasn't followed up on that one isn't because the media didn't know. 
a lot of effort was made to let me know, but because looking at it, they didn't seem to be anything like that. So I think the second, cla the second claim is the weaker one. The first claim, there might be something there or there might not, and I see why France would be concerned about the effectiveness of the vaccines, but that also doesn't uh, really address safety in any way. If there was a problem with the data, I hope that, they, that Merck gets a really hefty punishment for that, because that's the kind of thing that really shouldn't happen. But at this point, we haven't even started fact-finding, so we don't know. So I don't have an answer to your question, uh, to be perfectly honest. I can tell you that the people who monitor vaccine safety are completely walled off and separate from the people who distribute the vaccines or promote the vaccines at CDC. So vaccine safety has been completely walled off from all of the rest of CDC. You may or may not choose to believe that or give credit to for those people, but, but that's all I can try to do to reassure you. So let's try and take at least a few more people. Are the people over here or you're not waiting for the microphone? Can you hear me? Uh, I think I'm going to be a minority in the speakers. Um, what I'm seeing kind of going down here is rather alarming to me. Uh, my name's Carol, I'm an instructor at City College, San Francisco, I teach microbiology. Um, I also teach a disease, um, emerging disease class. I also teach about HIV, and I've been working in that field for, since the inception of the epidemic. Um, and I'm also an immune suppressed person who depends on other people to uh, be vaccinated to protect me, um, rather identify with your story. Um, I'd just like to draw a parallel here that's really alarming me. Um, some years ago I went to a meeting in the Castro um, to hear about uh, advances for HIV and AIDS. Uh, however, the, the presenter at that meeting was uh, Peter Duisburg, and he had a rather large following show up at that meeting who were um, denialists, who were strongly in the camp of HIV does not cause AIDS. And of course, Peter Duisburg still advocates that position today. And we know what great harm the world has seen, especially South Africa, when People like Peter Duisburg get the ear of governments and they don't treat people. And there have been studies showing how many infants didn't get treated for HIV, uh, how many people died in the thousands um, during the period that they banned at antiretroviral drugs. And then we move to Wakefield, um, who has recently sought an audience in Oregon um, to testify against a Senate bill um, there that was um, going to question PDEs. And uh, for some reason, and I'm personally thankful for whatever that reason was, um, that testimony was, and the meeting was canceled. It was deemed unnecessary by the senators. But Wakefield, um, who is the guy that published this 1998 quote autism link study with MMR, which is not only untrue but falsified, um, is seeking an audience in the U.S. and particularly on the West Coast. And um, I'm very alarmed that there are parallels between this kind of, these kind of characters getting the ears of parents and politicians and doing harm. And I think people will die as a result. And I would like to know if the lawyer would, would have a comment on this. Are these individuals, can they be held liable for we already had a such answer to that question, that would be difficult. But I mean, it is almost seven, so maybe very quickly. The answer is that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the law it depends. Yes, maybe. Uh, to remind you, that is free speech greatly, and we have very powerful protection of it. We do have a court called misrepresentation that caused bodily harm, and it's possible theoretically to use it, but it's a very hard thing to prove. 
basically, to a large extent, the way we deal with ideas in the U.S. is through the market of ideas more than through a lawsuit. So it's theoretically possible it's going to be a very hard claim. So, so why don't we try and have just one more on this side that we are at 7 o'clock, so I don't want to go too much over here. Yes, sir. Um, hi, I'd like to speak actually as an educator, um, uh, really about the autism link, and uh, Dr. Kaplan, you said you became aware in the like, early 2000s that this was becoming an issue for parents. Um, I was actually a head of special needs of a vast number of public schools in England, if you tell my accent, uh, prior to that, in the like, late 80s and 90s. And I look back now on all these children, we have all these anecdotes from parents saying, you know, my child had autism, I'm sure it was the vaccines, and whatever. But I look back at all those children, all those IEPs I wrote for all those children, and I can think of one, one child today who I think would have got uh, autism, not severe not severe at all, uh, diagnosis back in those days. Now I look at today, everywhere I go, I meet other families, my children go out to play dates, I go to 4-H, I go to Girl Scouts, and there are autistic children everywhere. Now I know Dr. Kevin, I've read your paper, and I know that you see that there's, uh, you see that there's an increase in um, diagnoses, that people want the diagnosis because they get um, funding and so on. So I'm sure that is maybe a small part, but it is so unconvincing to me to not say there is an environmental cause somewhere for this autism epidemic. And it's horrifying to me to think that one in 68 children by 2010, and I don't have the statistics, is, you know, this, epi this is an epidemic we're talking about. We're not talking about 170 children with measles. We're talking in one, of one in 68 going up to one in 50 going up to one in what in a few years. Now, I'm not saying vaccines causes this, but there's something happening in my head saying, why did I never see these children? Either I did a terrible job and didn't notice them, or they weren't there. And I can say, I, you know, I was doing a good job. Those children were not in our classrooms. So parents are looking at that. It might sound anecdotal, but I can look back on hundreds of children and tell you that is not anecdotal. That is a professional that can look back on that. Then also we have, um, in the early 200s, uh, 2000s, as you say, parents are... Uh, um, starting to get suspicious, starting to get concerned. Around that time, my godson, um, his family pediatrician, he was diagnosed with autism later in the uh, 2000s, diagnosed with autism. His pediatrician was then, the family pediatrician, was uh, diagnosed himself with cancer. He'd been the whole family, the generations, pediatrician. He came to my, the god, my godson's mother and apologized and said, I realize now what I did. Now that's purely anecdotal, but he apologized to her virtually on his deathbed he did. He had no idea he had trusted the research. So there's that. So on top of that, I'm looking at, as parents, and myself as a professional, uh, I just want to read a little, we've had the CDC uh, senior scientist. My name is William Thompson. I am a senior scientist with the Centers for Dis Disease Control and Prevention, where I have worked since 1998. This was a statement last August. Now this didn't suddenly appear from the US, we're kind of being led to believe. This, there's a whole trail of letters he was writing to his superiors. Incidentally, one of them then became a director at Merck, the producer of the MMR, um, stating his concerns about the, the uh, article that was published. I regret that my co-authors and I omitted statistically significant information in our 2004 article published in the journal Pediatrics. The omitted data suggested that African-American males who received the MMR vaccine before age 36 months were at increased risk for autism. Decisions were made. Thank, thanks very much, Paul. Just, we're just here. really out of time I know. For, I, for any further uh, comments. Thank you. So I'm wondering if the um, uh, final words uh, from the panel before we wrap up. I would just make a very short comment, if I could, in response to that, that, that the, the rise, of, as a pediatrician and a parent, the rise in autism is clearly something of great concern. It's a very complex issue, and the linking of that issue to vaccines is, is uh, highly problematic from the public health perspective, and the fact that we don't know what's responsible for the rise in autism is also hugely problematic. There is, as Dr. Schwartzberg said at the beginning, and I would reiterate, very compelling evidence that, that, that 
there's no compelling evidence that vaccines are responsible for that. So I think that the cause that I would share with you is to work very hard to find out what underlies the increase in autism. I agree, and I would say in the meantime, if there is a chance that it's the vaccines, we cannot surely in all conscience be forcing parents to questioning this. And that's not me. I'm talking about the parents of the, the children that I educate. If they're questioning this, if there is a question mark, we cannot expect parents to play Russian roulette with their children, and I don't think that is in, in any part, that's just inconsequential. Sorry. Thanks. I want to thank our panelists and. Uh,